Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, who is Dr. David Hildig-Smith, the president of the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society. He's done a tremendous work over many years uh, at the University of Sussex, and uh, it has been a, role, a big role in CTO, having created actually one of the most commonly used uh, CTO prediction scores as well. So, David, uh, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, can you tell us a little bit, how did this all start for you? Did you always want to become an interventionalist? Uh, did this happen by design? Was it some circumstances that saved your career? Yeah, it depends how far back you want to go. But I mean, I suppose have, once I got you know, qualified and decided, I did anesthetics for a while. And then I, and then I, but I really thought, oh, I'd, I'd like to do cardiology, but it, it looks a bit competitive. Um, and I'm not sure, you know. And then I did get a job. And once I got a job in cardiology, I thought, oh, this is really good. And I liked it. And But actually, I liked, I really liked having some independent responsibilities. So for the first few years, I did a lot of pacing um, because the consultants weren't very interested in that in, in my hospital in Patworth at the time. And um, so we did all the, pa- the registrars did all the pacing. So I really liked pacing and lead extraction and stuff like that. But then I got to have an opportunity to do um, some intervention, particularly with Len Shapiro, who was a sort of, um, he was just one of those people who was able to create something out of nothing, if you see what I mean. And, and so I admired him greatly. And gradually it became clear that, yes, I, I would like to do intervention. And fortunately, I, I, I got the necessary steps, if you like, to, to get to the position where I was able to get an interventional post as a consultant. Perfect. And then um, how, how did you decide to get into the complex area, doing the complex case and the CTO and all that work? Yeah, I guess that, that came by chance in a way in that, you know, I started my consultant job here in Brighton, 20, 22 years ago now. And um, it took a while. I suppose there was an element of competitiveness about it that you were trying to, you wanted to show that you could do something and you wanted to show that you were able to offer more. And you, you always wanted to, I suppose you always wanted that element of competition to to try and say, oh, I'm, I, I want people to think I'm good at this. And, um, and so I suppose you started to do that. And we all, we all did a little bit of CTO, you know, at that time. That was a, it was a different time. And, and I suppose I liked the challenge of the complexities. And, and I remember the first time I went to a CTO workshop in Massey, in fact, it was. And I saw Dr. Saito doing a CTO and he was using techniques that I'd never seen. He was taking this wire and he was sort of dr- drilling this wire through. And by the time the preamble had finished and people saying, welcome, Dr. Saito, he's so marvelous. He's going to show us how to do this CTO. And and, and so over to you, Shigeru. And he'd finished. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd sort of drilled this wire through the vessel and out the other end. And I thought, I asked people, I said, what's, what's that? What's that he's doing? Well, I've never seen this. So, so I think you know it was it was an area where suddenly there was novelty and innovation. You know, I'd been used to a, an environment where there was really only one coronary wire, and you passed that down, and then there was a you know selection maybe two or three balloons, and um, and then if that all went all right, you put a stent in. But here was a whole new world where things that looked on the face of it completely absurd and impossible could actually sometimes be reopened with special techniques. So that really piqued my interest. And then 
from you know getting the interest to actually developing the skills and doing the cases, there's obviously some work there. So how did you learn? Would you learn by people uh, watching people, uh, inviting people, going people to places? How did you actually learn to do this procedure? Yeah, so, so for anti-grade stuff, uh, I learned, I think, probably mostly on my own plus, of course, what I was learning from going to uh, workshops and things like that. And actually at the time, I don't know, 2005 or thereabouts, there wasn't that much. There was the, the annual Massey workshop, and then there were things that were largely out of my scope in, in, in Japan, for example. But um, mostly I think I learned rather by trial and error a bit myself, um, as probably many people do when they're embracing a new technique. And, you know, I, I learned some really key things from going to those workshops about how to set up and how to approach a, 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 an occlusion. But, but yeah, I suppose there's no, there's no substitute in a way for actually hands-on experience. And later on for retrograde, which we'll probably talk about later, um, I did invite people specifically because I thought, okay, this is different. This is a whole new approach. I don't want to get starting off to do something and finding myself out of my depth suddenly. So I invited a couple of people to to come and help us start that program. And then how did you deal with, uh, you know, failure and complications since these are common, you know, especially those days, but even today, you know, this is something that happened. Yes. So failure was always uh, a disappointment, but, you know, manageable because, you know, it w- if it was failure without damage, then of course, you know, it's it's disappointing and you don't like to let patients down. If you like, you know, they've been lying there for two hours hoping you're going to fix it and then you have to say to them, oh, this is proving really difficult and I'm really sorry I haven't been able to, you know, open up this blockage. So that's, that's personal disappointment, you know, on their behalf kind of thing. Um, complications more more of a problem i mean i was i think i was fortunate really in my most of my cto career to not to have had that many really bad complications and maybe that just means i sort of didn't kind of push the frontiers as much as some other people but but certainly when there when there were complications and this applies to any sphere of you know work it was it's always difficult because you you then you then worry you know did I go too far did I do too much was this about me rather than about the patient you know was I was I careful uh did I make sure I I I did everything correctly you know so yes that always requires a period of self-reflection to you know, reassess and and just find your position again. Be able to say, okay, and just make sure. Yes, did I, was I careful enough? Did I did I consider the consequences of continuing, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So yes, complications are always hard. And uh, in terms of uh, how you feel during those cases, you know, back then and now, um, do you feel stressed? Do you feel anxious? Do you feel calm? Yeah. Um, so I think, generally speaking, I feel pretty calm, like most operators probably, until I get a sense that something's not quite right, and especially if something's not quite right, but I don't know what it is yet. So, for example, you know, when patients start to become a bit uncomfortable, and maybe the blood pressure's a little bit lower, and the ST segments are sagging a bit, and there's a there's a moment that comes. I'm sure this is familiar to most interventionists when you think, okay, I'm no longer fully in charge of this procedure. <laughs> yeah, I'm no longer really in control, and I'm and something's not quite right. But I haven't worked out what's wrong yet. And there's that moment where there's the the potential for the onset of slight panic, which of course you must 
keep really in check and you have to lead the team in the cath lab. So at all stages, you have to remain calm, even though inside you're sort of paddling wildly, trying to think what's happening, what's going on, I don't really know. So so there is, there is definitely a border that you cross where suddenly you think, oh, I'm this thing's spiraling a bit out of control and we could be in trouble here. And then um, how do you deal with this uh, uh, later on? Let's say something went bad. Do you get depressed for a while? Do you get over it quickly? Yeah. How, do you, how do you deal with the inevitable complications? That's a nice question. I mean, what happens to me is that, you know, and it happens several times a year usually, is that something bad goes wrong with a procedure, whatever, whatever sort of procedure it is. And there's a bad outcome uh, of, of various types, you know, stroke, death, bad outcomes. And what normally happens to me is I worry about it. I sleep really poorly. I wake up early. And I know that it's going to last about a week. And it takes me a week of reflection about the case, worrying about it, thinking, did I do the right things? Did I make the good choices? Am I ready to to take on the next difficult case or not? You know, and, and after about a week, I'm usually sort of okay again. Although, and we may discuss this later, I don't know, in the UK system, and I'm sure this is replicated in other systems, sometimes you're obliged to relive that experience repeatedly in front of different taskmasters. So morbidity and mortality meetings, legal issues, coroner, court, things like that, which can be pretty wearing, you know, because you try so hard and then you slightly feel, well, well no one gave me credit for the the nine that I got through that were really horrible, but we managed it. And and to the 10th one, when there's a problem, suddenly I'm called to account for it. So it can be, you have to, you have to balance yourself carefully to make sure that you don't allow that to become too upsetting. And sometimes it's tricky. Yeah. So it's more of a grieving process, I guess, getting, getting through this and eventually, getting over the, the situation. Actually, you're right. This is the same in many other systems. Other people have said the same thing, that it does take a while. Now, it depends on the systems. I think there are some M&Ms uh, in many places as well. Um, but you're right. It, this can be something that you have to disclose. I remember I had to uh, have a similar thing and actually had to... Um, I wrote a case report about it. I wrote a case report, a justification about what happened. So it's, oh, really? it, can be, it can be a little tricky. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Now, are there any cases that stand out to your memory, things that you know weren't either good or bad and that really taught you a lot and you remember them today? Um, I mean, well, I mean, yes and no, but the problem is that the human brain being what it is, I mean, there, <clears throat> there are a couple that I remember that are very, um, you know, involved quite significant complications because I suppose those are the ones that really imprint themselves on you and repeat in your brain. So, so one one particular case which I won't ever forget <laughs> is when we when we started to do retrograde CTOs, and we had arranged this. We we had. Uh, gone to quite some lengths to to get a, a proctor, and this was some many years ago. Uh, and the whole thing was set up carefully, and we were going to have two two cases, two or three cases, as I recall. And probably through a combination of factors that involved miscommunication we ended up with a situation where the patient had clot, 
developing in the left main. And it was suddenly a bit out of control because there was a there was also a language, a communication issue, which was not straightforward. And and of course, the reason I remember it so much is that the operator had had shown us and had achieved a retrograde position, but but suddenly the, the case was spiraling out of control. And then there was quite a lot of activity involving wires. And the net result, very sadly, was that the patient died about an hour after the procedure. But but the thing that really uh, stayed with me, apart from the the difficulties with the the correction of the problems that had occurred during the procedure, was the fact that right at the end, when she had gone back to intensive care and was being looked after by the anaesthetists, this was some years ago, it, it turned out that we failed to realise that she was actually dying of a second complication, which was pericardial tamponade. So she was doing so badly and so badly and kept trying to keep it going. But then eventually she basically died of a treatable problem. And it's conceivable that had we corrected that, she she might have survived. Anyway, there was quite a lot of head scratching after that and then people sort of saying, oh, this person was aged X and they had a chronic occlusion and really their symptoms were blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was it was difficult. The whole the whole time was difficult because this was new. This was novel. This was not not the ideal start to a retrograde program. And actually, funnily enough, that that stalled our personal development of doing any retrograde for I think about two years. Really, after that, the the experience had been such that okay, we're we're, we're going to park that. And I think it was only two years later that we we had a. a a, another proctor came and we did some cases and it was excellent and we learned a lot and we were able finally to start start the program but you know we we took a step back obviously it was a horrible experience um and probably rightly you know we 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 stopped we spent some time appraising what we had why things had gone wrong and we weren't that enthusiastic to to start again until yes as you said earlier until really that grieving period had passed and obviously that was a catastrophic complication and you're right that this could have a lasting long lasting impact but there are some interventionalists who say that hey the moment you have a bad thing happen a complication then you should go ahead and do quickly another case, so you don't. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you subscribe to this uh, to this idea because their thinking is that it's bad. But it's tricky. I think. I mean, I think get as as people describe getting back on the horse is important, but get back on a friendly horse. You know. So if you've just been if you've just been sort of bucked off. Uh, a tricky horse. Don't get don't get on a tricky horse again for a little bit. So so get back in the lab. Get your hands scrubbed again, uh, but do do some e- easier cases, you know. And I think that's a common phenomenon. And I know the feeling of when I've had a major complication, or perhaps I've been, I don't know, ill or so- something, and I, I'm I'm not co- I'm not really ready for a really complicated case. And I'd just like to do a few simple cases. You know, regain your confidence. Hit hit a ball out of the park that's just lobbed up to you in a friendly manner. Okay, I can feel that again. I, I I'm I'm getting back into the swing of things. Perfect. <laughs> and now, David, you've done so much work not only on CTOs but also bifurcation, so many other areas, um, and you've actually done extensive research on the topic as well. So, how could you be able to combine? You know, you're one of the few people who actually combines the clinical aspects of the procedure, we're actually studying it and improving our understanding of those procedures. So how were we able to marry those two areas? 
Yeah, it's it is quite difficult, um, and you you have to allocate sort of extra time if if you like. So so I think um, I've done it probably quite a lot by working over time, um, and and I'm I'm quite a quick worker, so I don't I don't uh, I don't spend a great deal of time finessing details if i'm trying to get if i want to get a study done i i will canvas people's views canvas support for it try to see if people are interested and then i'll go straight to a company and try to say would you potentially be interested in this and try and get some interest going on that and and it's the personal contacts and and then write the protocol and and not spend too much time finessing the the details until a little bit later um i don't really want to spend 100 hours on something and then somebody say we're not very interested in this so i'd like to get some some uh impetus going first but i think you know the first trial i i wrote and got done once I'd come to Brighton, which was a bifurcation trial, the BBC One trial, it was, it was, um, it, it was a good time for it. You know, it was a question that kept coming up at meetings. And I think I was just lucky, really, that I, I, I did have the determination to, to try and coordinate it. And I was lucky that people were willing to support me and say, OK, no, that's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll, will join your trial that's an interesting question and uh, there wasn't much money around you know to to either fund it or um give to the participants for the work that they were having to do so so i was lucky but yes it, it's it certainly is something that takes time which is outside your job and you have to you have to want to allocate that to it and as you said being a busy interventionist how do you learn to navigate the research pathways? You say the fundraising, the writing, the planning, the execution, all these things that go with uh, the research. Um, yeah. Is it also just doing it? or Yes. So, so I'm very much somebody who doesn't like to, you know, I'm not very good. I won't read the instruction manual um, before, <laughs> before doing something. I mean, I think most interventionists are broadly the same. You, we, I challenge most people <laughs> if they know the instructions for use for the device. But uh, so I think I like to try to uh, m- make each step and and try and get people to come along with me uh, w- without having to spend too much time fin- finessing the details. And I think I've... I've sort of carved a path of of my own in that respect. I I know how to uh, write a protocol relatively quickly. I know how to submit things. I I'm, I I find writing relatively straightforward, so I I can write a submission quite quickly, uh, encapsulate the ideas reasonably succinctly, and so it gives people an opportunity to say yes or say no. And then I've been very lucky. I've had a fantastic research department in Brighton and have been able often to delegate things to them, particularly once I'd had a a background of getting things to completion. Um, They would be supportive and say, okay, we'll help you. We'll we'll help with the the submissions. And, of course, everything's got much more complicated over the last 20 years. I mean, the very first randomised trial I did, I, I submitted something to an ethics committee on two pieces of A4 and was randomizing people with a little brown envelope that had either a R for radial or a B for brachial and would just sort of hand them to the patients. And that's how the randomization went. And it was incredibly straightforward. Um, and it's got very much more complicated, but fortunately now I'm sort of insulated by a team of people who will help do all those things because I'm, I'm not going to. Wonderful. And then in terms of the teaching, you've taught so many people throughout the years on, on multiple areas. How do you choose your your uh, your fellows, the people you train? 
Yeah, so you know, it's always a bit of hit and miss, you know, when you when you choose a fellow, because of course you 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 choose somebody based on their determination to apply and their apparent aptitude, given that they're being backed by various people. Um, but actually, you never really know until they start whether they're going to suit you and you're going to suit them. Now, nearly always you find a happy medium where you, you work out what their attributes are and you let them excel at that area. Now, for some people, that's writing manuscripts. For other people, it's doing the interventions. For some people, it's both. Um, and you just slowly, slowly introduce them into the, into the catheter lab. Firstly, show them what you're doing next let them start to do things and, and, and you're right there next to them teaching them, you know, and slowly, slowly you get the, the idea of whether they're good or not. But, but the, the selection process is relatively um, uh, poorly informed, if you like, as to whether they're necessarily going to be a, a good interventionist. It's just that they have a, a stellar CV and they're, got the aptitude to and the determination to come and seek out the opportunity. And what do you find to be the most difficult thing to teach them on both the clinical and the research side? Ooh, I mean, that, that varies from person to person. Now, some people, so I'll start with the writing. Some people naturally write well and understand that it needs to be succinct and it needs to be short sentences, and it needs to be really clear. And other people, it's really hard work to, to edit their prose into something less stodgy. Uh, so, so for the writing, I must say, I find, I know, I know the first time they, they do anything, whether they have the aptitude for it or not. And so sometimes you're, you're just making very slight adjustments for someone who already really has it and other times you are taking someone from quite a, a baseline level and trying to get them up a, a few runs. Um, with regard to the clinical stuff, the, the, the hardest thing in a way for, I think, for a trainer is when you have a, com a combination of somebody who's quite good at doing things but also lacks insight into what's happening. So somebody who's fairly skilled, but doesn't have very good antennae, you know, to, to understand what's going on and, and know the boundaries of when to, when to pursue, when to stop, that can be awkward because suddenly you may come into a lab and find Oh my goodness! What what are you doing? You know, well, <laughs> how did you get here? Uh, because because they haven't sort of stopped and thought. Oh, I've actually I've never done this before, so maybe I better ask somebody to come and join me, or, or maybe they've done a procedure on one of your you know consultant colleagues without sort of asking you or, or something like that. You know, so so th those situations can be slightly difficult, but. Mo you know, our trainees have, have been almost uniformly excellent. People tend to listen, pause, you know, wait, learn, be prepared to try when they think they've understood, you know. So to most people coming, of course, they've already done 15 years or whatever of, of learning and stuff. So most people come and they're really, really very, very receptive and good and and patient and and you know we've we've been very lucky to have outstanding fellows over the years wonderful so david with all the responsibilities and the duties you have the clinical work all the research work it's a lot of work during hours and after hours how do you keep uh, yourself uh, in good shape fit to be able to do all this uh yeah i uh, <laughs> i don't i i i'm <laughs> 
Well, I look at the thing on my Apple uh, phone, see if I've done many steps. Uh, it's not as many as it should be, really. Um, I know the number 10,000 was totally made up, but it's, it's yeah. I don't, I'm not very good at uh, exercise. I walk. I don't like to go too fast. Um, so, yes, but I, so what do I do? I do a bit of gardening. I do a bit of walking. I do a bit of trying to trying to still my brain, if you see what I mean. You know, just re- let go of the all the stuff to do with work that's buzzing around, and try and try and relax. You know, spend time with my children. Simple things, yeah. And, and how has your family? Um been able to put up, if you will, about all this hard work and over hours and uh, all the things that go along with that? Yeah, I mean, they've been great, really. They've rarely um, made um, comments about it. I mean, I I think I, you know, I work a bit less now than I, than I used to, or at least, or at least I'm a bit more um, focused on what I will do and what I won't just get into accepting because I've been asked. Um, so I think they just assume that that's what dad does. You know, dad works. Dad probably isn't going to retire, you know, because people often say, oh, you you know, you, you, you must be nearly 60 or something. You're going to retire soon. And I sort of go, yeah, not really. I don't really, what, just to, just to sort of, sit around and read novels that I'm not, I'm not planning to No, Um, so I think they just think, well, that's what dad does, but, but I'm, I hope I'm pretty available to them, you know, emotionally and physically just to, as a, as a person, um, you know, and, and obviously I like to spend a lot of time with them and I try to, uh, avoid my work getting, too much in the way of that. And then, do you have any favorite books or any favorite movies? Oh, uh, uh, favorite books or movies. Um, fa- um, favorite book, it's hard. I, I, I was, you know, it depends what mood you're in when you read a book, doesn't it? So I read, what was it, Engleby by Sebastian Folks, um, which was about, it was a clever book. It was about mental health and sort of gradual destruction of a human being, if you like, written unknowingly, if you like, from the point of view, unknowingly from the readers, but from the point of view of the of the, the victim, as it were, or the you know, the person with the the condition and so that that had a big influence on me and probably yeah probably in the same vein um a film that had a big impact on me was the english patient by uh written, written the novel was by on Diart, i think and it was it was an amazing uh evocation of love in all its, well, many of its various forms. And I remember it made me very emotional and tearful. And, and you don't always know why, but it had quite a profound effect on me. And, and I, I remembered it very strongly for weeks, you know, after seeing it. So, yeah. So basically, I'm just an emotional wreck. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're holding yourself pretty well together, I must say, at least any time we'll see you in the meetings and everything. But um, So, David, what are you most proud of? You've done so many things, so many achievements, but what is the thing that you're most proud of, both personally and professionally? Oh, golly. I mean, proud of my family, obviously, from a personal point of view. Uh, I'm proud of being president of my society. I mean, I, I put myself forward and I... But, but obviously people had to vote for me. I'm Yes, I'd be proud of that. Um, professionally as well, I think 
I think probably doing the amount of research that we've done for a for a unit that's only been exist in existence for 25 years. I think we've done a lot of research work. And I guess I'm proud of the fact also that the the department, which you know, there was only four of us when I joined, has attracted some very strong clinicians and researchers since then. So we now have a really a really good team who will be able to, you know, take things further. Um yeah, so I guess those things I would I would consider that I it was reasonable for me to feel proud about, yes. Wonderful. And then how many hours do you sleep? Oh, I like to sleep. I would like to sleep more. I like sleep. I would sleep probably eight hours. Yeah, I really try. I mean, maybe not quite so many, but yeah, I like sleeping. <laughs> And then... Well, I guess uh, many people do, but not not everyone uh, actually does it. But... Yeah, yeah. And then what is the painting behind you? I know oh. it's very rare to have a nice office with a full painting behind you. Yes, that's right. So this is a mural that was that came with the house actually. So it's it's a it's a painting of Siena uh in Italy mm. that just happened to adorn one of the walls of my house. So I sort of looked at it and thought, oh, that's weird. We'll probably have to paint over that. And then I thought, oh, no, hang on, wait a second. It's actually really good. I really like it. And so obviously they, I must have known that the pandemic was coming as well because I then spent a couple of years sitting in front of this and everyone would always say, what's that painting behind you? <laughs> what if, what if, are you sitting in an art gallery or something? So it was a perfect Zoom background for me for a few years. <laughs> That's perfect. Well, it's it looks it does look amazing. I would admit. <laughs> so so da so David again um, again phenomenal um, uh, outline and thanks for sharing all these insights with us. But if you had to summarize like your key points of advice for someone who is starting now or is early stages of their career, what would you advise them to do? Early stages of an interventional career. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's an interesting question. I would advise them to play a long game. That So this is probably most specifically useful to the UK environment, which I'm most familiar with. I think sometimes people are over keen to, to show what they can do and to establish themselves in a particular role. And actually what works really best, at least certainly in the UK system, is turn up, be friendly, pretty much always say yes, that's fine, I'll do that list, I'll do that, I'll do that thing. So that everybody gets to be comfortable with you. Don't rush in and try and do something. I'm I'm As I'm saying this, I'm reminded of a, a surgeon who started in Patworth when I was a trainee there. And the minute he started, he changed the routine operation into something different because he really believed in it and he really wanted to make it happen. But he, he did it much too quickly. Nobody got taken along with him. And so when the results weren't great, suddenly he was under a lot of pressure because he'd, he'd gone at it too quickly. So, you know, bide your time, be friendly, say yes, be flexible, work hard. You know, I mean, actually, if you do that and you have skills, you're going to be a great colleague. And um, we've been lucky to appoint some people like that in Brighton. And uh, you can see the difference when you have somebody who's not like that. And it can, it can really upset a department. So, yeah, I guess those would be my words of advice. Not very revolutionary, but practical. Perfect. And you're right. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. It can take some time. 
And and to finish off, maybe you can tell us your plans for the future. As you mentioned, you're not planning to take a to take a retirement anytime soon, from what I understand. So what 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 are your plans for the future, and what are you excited about? Yeah, I I don't really know what my plans are for the future. So at the moment, I'm, I'm president of the society for three years, so I got another two and a half years or something to go. At the end of that, I will uh, be more back in Brighton, and I think. You know, what I've normally done is is I've rarely had pre-planned um, ideas. Yeah, there may be some things I like to do, like, you know, maybe I want to go fly fishing, maybe I want to play the piano some more, maybe I want to, you know, learn Russian. Actually, I don't, but, you know, maybe, so, you know there'll, be, there'll be some things. But, but um, I will probably take opportunities as they come that are that are slightly different so i i won't know about them in advance but if i'm offered something that i think looks interesting i may may take it but you know the for me the the the, the bit of my job that i think i've been best at and other people will be able to tell me whether this is true or not, is actually doing the procedures individually for an individual patient. So dealing with the patient that's in front of you and hopefully usually treating them well and with respect and and trying to get something achieved for them. And of course, the thing that can be most satisfying of all is, for example, a CTO or something where perhaps somebody else hasn't been able to be successful and the patient is very invested in in trying to have a good result. And if you are able to do it, then of course, that's really great all round. And and I I do I do rather feel that my my skills lie in that direction. So I think I will continue to want to do interventional procedures um, f- for a fair long time to come. But but what I would also like to do is, you know, if somebody comes along who's clearly got the aptitude and will be better than me, then I will be pleased to kind of teach them the to the extent that I know and say, okay, this is yours now. And uh, I'll step back and I'll, I'll do some other stuff. So, you know, you always want to have people that essentially leapfrog you and, and take the service further. So over time, as that happens, I, I will change my role as I have done already. I mean, I used to do biventricular pacemakers. I used to do lead extractions and stuff like that. I was head of pacing in Brighton and I was appointed. So, you know, things change. <laughs> and maybe that's the good note to end. So things are changing for everyone and for every yeah. field and especially for CTO. So as you say, you no one knows, but it's good to have, uh, you know, some plans and some idea and then things will take their own way. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much again. Uh, It's been a pleasure um, talking with you today. Thanks for your insights, which I think we'll find for myself and other people very useful down the line. Thank you so much, and I'm sure we'll run to each other. one of the Absolutely. Thank you so much, Manos. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 